Good morning. It's good to be here, amen? And this morning as we um, get into the sermon, I just wanted to say that I chose my title and then it seemed like my title was popping up all over the place. And I thought, well, everybody's going to think I got it from there and there and there. Um, I did know I had heard it somewhere, but it amazed me how many times it was showing up on on uh, titles of articles and the review and everything like this right after I put it in the bulletin. But anyway, <laughs> an attitude of gratitude. Yes, Thanksgiving is past. And our eyes are already shifting, especially with the help of all these beautiful flowers, (laughs) to the next holiday that's coming. But I thought I wanted to spend just a little more time on Thanksgiving and what God has done for us. So let's begin with prayer. Dear Father, we thank you, Lord. We thank you for everything you have done for us. And this morning I pray that as we open your word, that we will find even more to be thankful for and grateful to the, for the things that you have done for us. For Jesus' sake, amen. Paul had been in prison for some time and hoping for a soon release, hoping that soon he could, he could get out, go visit some of his friends, loved ones all over the, all over the world at that point. So he writes at that point in time, he writes to those in Philippi, people who were close to his heart. You remember Philippi? Philippi is where when he went into town, there was no synagogue, no place to worship. No, well, no synagogue. And so he went to a place of worship by the river. And there he found a group of ladies and he talked to them about the gospel, about Jesus. And one of them was named Lydia, and she and her whole household were baptized. And after they were baptized, it's interesting that this is the point in Acts, where up until that point, it just is always talking about Paul as they, and they were doing this, and they were denied going here, and then God sent them to Macedonia, and they went to, and and here, all of a sudden, Paul says, and we. I mean, Luke says, writing the book of Acts, sorry, writing the book of Acts, Luke says, and we went on. And it, and all of a sudden, Luke is a part of the picture. So Luke is a part of this story in Philippi also. And he apparently spent some time. They stayed with Lydia and spent some time establishing a church there. And as they were constantly witnessing, they run into a slave girl on the streets who had the, the gift of telling the future. And she just follows them all over, say, saying, I know who you are. You guys are the are, are servants of the Most High God. And apparently Paul felt like that was a distraction he didn't want it. And so he turned and, and asked the Lord to send the demons out of that poor girl. And he did. And she was converted. And her owners were not happy campers. And so they had Paul and his companion at the time. uh, Simon is what came to mind. And it's not Silas. There we go. Paul and Silas. (laughs) Paul and Silas were thrown into prison. Feet put in stocks. And at midnight, they were singing. Let's read it, Acts 16, 24, and 25. Acts 16, 24, and 25. Upon receiving such orders, he, the jailer, put them in the inner cell, fastened their feet in the stocks. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. And the other prisoners were listening to them. Praying and singing hymns in the middle of prison with their feet hurting. They'd been whipped. But they were praying and singing. And you know what happened next? An earthquake shook the, shook the doors off the hinges and opened up 
and shook all the chains off. And the jailer thought, oh no, I'm in trouble. I'm going to be in disgrace. And he was ready to kill himself. And Paul says, oh, don't do that. We're all here. And the jailer says, tell me about your God. I want to know your God. And he was baptized with his whole household. It's an amazing story. And we see Paul at that time in the prison, praising God, singing hymns. And now he writes a letter to the Philippians full of rejoicing and gratitude. You know, the way it's describing Paul, I kind of think I would have liked to have known this guy. Always happy, always rejoicing, singing songs. Sounds like the kind of person I'd like to know. The Greek word for rejoice is Cairo, and it occurs 29 times in all of Paul's letters. Nine, a third of them, nine are found in the book of Philippians. Paul rejoices in different ways throughout this book and for different reasons. And we're going to take a look at them this morning in the book of Philippians. We're going to have a little mini-series on the book of Philippians, actually, the next few times I speak. Some see about three different themes in the book. And in time, we'll look at all of those themes. But at this time of Thanksgiving, I wanted to focus on Paul himself and how he brought this attribute of joy and thankfulness that shines out through the book of Philippians. He begins his letter with thoughts of thankfulness and joy for his friends. Partner, he calls them partners in the Gospels. Let's look at, look at it. Philippians 1, verses 3 and 4. Philippians 1, verses 3 and 4. It says, I thank my God every time I remember you in all my prayers for all of you. I always pray with joy. Because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Have you recently thanked the people around you for what they bring to your life? Paul did it. We can do it. We should do it. We need to thank those around us for what they bring into our lives. Then he goes on. And we're, what we're doing now is we're just looking at the passages in Philippians, so you can turn Philippians, we're going to be there a lot. <laughs> we're looking at the passages where he talks about rejoicing and joy and pulling lessons from it. So the first thing we can learn is that he thanked his friends for what they had done for him. The second thing is Philippians 1, 12 through 18. Philippians 1, 12 through 18. Now I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. As a result, it became clear through the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. Because of my chains, most of the brothers in the Lord, now notice he said most, that means there were some who weren't. Most of the brothers in the Lord have been encouraged to speak the word of God more courageously and fearlessly. It's true yeah, it's true that some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, but others out of goodwill. The latter do so in love, knowing I'm put here for the defense of the gospel. The former preach Christ out, out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing they can stir up trouble for me while I'm in chains. So what does it matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached. And because of this, I rejoice. Yes, and I will continue to rejoice. That's amazing. Here there are people who are preaching, hoping to get Paul in trouble, hoping to make it harder for Paul. And I can almost hear and see him, imagine him on his knees, struggling with that knowledge and saying, Lord, you're going to have to help me with this. The thing is, he comes up praising God that souls are being saved. He says, what does it matter? Christ is being preached. 
Can we learn something from that? I think we can. Tolerance of others, even when their motives are vengeful. It's so easy to feel that someone is doing things in such a way to hurt us, to get back at us for something. But what did Paul do? He prayed about it and he found a way to praise God over it because souls were being won. Even in the middle of wrong motives, good things were happening. And he developed a tolerant, accepting, forgiving attitude to their treachery, accepting the situation and rejoicing over the soul's one, leaving it in the Lord's hands. We need that attitude ourselves more often. Third, rejoicing is a means of coping with tough times. Here he was in prison in Rome rejoicing. So he's rejoicing in the middle of tough times. That's how he copes. He's encouraging them to do the same thing. Philippians 2 verses 17 and 18. 17 and 18. Even though if I am being poured out like a drink offering on the sacrifice and service coming from your faith, I am glad and rejoice with all of you. So you too should be glad and rejoice with me. So rejoicing and being thankful can be a way of coping with tough times. And then in Philippians 3 verse 1, here's the fourth thing that Paul does with rejoicing. In Philippians 3 verse 1, Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. It's no trouble for me to write the same things to you again, and it is a safeguard for you. And then he goes on and he talks about doctrinal things. I think that we can see from this that Paul is rejoicing over our beliefs, over what he believes, over believing in Jesus. These are things we can rejoice in, our doctrines, the things that we believe in. It's interesting that he first says rejoice, and then as a safeguard for them, it says, he moves on to give a warning against the legalists in the church, those who are constantly pressing to live life in a certain prescribed way. you got to do it just like this. And he preaches against that, his response to those people who are preaching like that, I should say it this way, his response to them is to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we find that in the very next few verses. It's an amazing thing. Pick it up at verse 6, where he's describing himself before Christ. All right? He starts describing his own life, and this is what he says in verse 6. As for zeal, persecuting the church. As for legalistic righteousness, faultless. Wow. That says a lot because the Pharisees, they were pretty much sticklers as for doing things just so. And here he says, describing himself as for legalistic righteousness, faultless. But then listen what he says. But whatever was to my profit... I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. Verse 8, what is more, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I lost all things. I consider them rubbish. Different translations say it different ways, but it's all the same idea. Rubbish, garbage. All of those things, living life perfectly, faultless. It's rubbish that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God and is by faith. Paul, over and over again, faced with those who want to do things just so, got to do everything just right, and that's how we're going to get to heaven. His answer is, that's all garbage and rubbish. I just want Jesus in my life. I want to be found in him. 
having his righteousness by faith. That's an amazing thought. And it's amazing for us. It's a big thing to be thankful for. What a, It's a beautiful passage that lays out such a strong reminder that our own works are nothing. And that we are saved by grace through faith. He goes on to give good advice about standing firm in the Lord. And we're going to look closer at that on another Sabbath. Today we're sticking to the theme of joy and thanksgiving, which pops up so often in this book. So let's move on to a classic verse that you probably all have memorized, at least most of you. Philippians 4, 4 through 7. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. That's a command. Rejoice in him always. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. I love that verse. It's one of my memory verses. I had to read it because I'm nervous, but <laughs> I love that verse. If we just thank God for everything, we don't need to be anxious about anything. And if we're trusting in him and thanking him, the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, is in our, will be in our minds and our hearts. That's what we need. If we do it, if we are rejoicing and thankful to God, there are benefits and the benefits, the first benefits he mentions here are peace in our minds, in our hearts. There's so much in that verse. And it's the heart of what we're talking about this morning. I, I couldn't help but be amazed at how the music that was sung and the, and the prayers and everything this morning before I stood up was just going right along with my sermon. God planned it good today. Being joyful and thankful to God. Did you notice it even names our holiday, Thanksgiving? I'd love to go into the history of Thanksgiving. I, I'm a little bit of an amateur, very amateur history buff, but it, the, the, the story of how Thanksgiving came about is just beautiful. The key to remember is that it is there for Thanksgiving to God. It was established for that purpose. And too often today, I'm afraid that that has just totally disappeared in what we talk about over Thanksgiving holiday. But, but we need to remember it's Thanksgiving to God and what he has done for us. Just a few verses later, Paul gives one of the key strategies that he uses to keep on rejoicing. And he needed some strategies. His life had a lot of ups and downs. But he starts by again thanking the people he's writing to, the Philippians, for their concern for him. Look at verse 10, verse 10. So this is beginning to look at how Paul rejoiced. In verse 10, I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you have renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you, ha you have been concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. I'm not saying this because I'm in need, for I have learned to be content in whatever the circumstances, I know what it is to be in need and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed, think last Thursday, or hungry, <laughs> whether living in plenty or in want. Paul experienced both. Having plenty and having lots of things and the depths of the pit, not having much at all, being in prison and hungry. He experienced both and he says he learned to be content no matter what. I can do everything through him who gives me strength. In our many years of evangelism, we met many people who were content. They were happy. The interesting thing is, it seemed to have nothing to do with how much 
they had. You would think that poor people would want more and not be content, and that rich people would have plenty and be happy. And there were some like that. But we saw a lot where it was just the reverse. And the poor people who had not much at all were content and happy with life, satisfied with what they had. And the rich people who had a lot of stuff were not content. They were unhappy and struggling with their lives, constantly wanting more things. It's clear that it's not the things themselves that brings happiness, but rather it's the attitude within that makes the difference, just like Paul said, learning to be content no matter what. He says that he learned the secret of contentment. What does it mean to learn something? Well, I study it. At least I did in school. <laughs> but is that all? If you just study it, then it's just stuff there on the page that you don't, or in, it doesn't come in and change how we're living. And that's what Paul did. He applied it to his life. He learned something and he applied it to his life. We need to do the same thing. I'd like to propose there's two secrets that Paul has had learned and applied to his life. The first one we've already talked about, and that's the gospel. And that just oozes out of Paul's letters all over the place. He, we read his testimony, and, and, it, and for him, that was the most important thing, to have Jesus. Everything else was nothing. To have Jesus in his life and his righteousness covering his life, that's the thing that he focused on. The second thing, that I think was a, a driving force because it just comes out of this letter so so much is rejoicing, the habit of rejoicing and giving thanks. And the Old Testament gives us a hint of how important it is. In Proverbs 17, 22, it says, a, a cheerful heart or a merry heart, a merry heart is good medicine, but a crushed spirit dries up the bones. When I was a child, one of my favorite books, we're talking little here, one of my favorite books was the little golden book version of Pollyanna. The story of a little missionary girl who learned with the help of her father to be glad about things even when everything didn't look happy, to when things looked sad, when things looked bad, he taught her to be glad, to find something to be glad about. Her loved father taught her the important lesson of joy from the Bible. And it talked, about, talked to her about how the Bible said to be joyful so many times. That's a lesson that we can learn too. We need more of that attitude. It's interesting that scientists are confirming that studies show that those who have an attitude of gratitude are better able to overcome illness and often live life longer. What do you usually do to elevate your mood? <laughs> Eat your favorite dessert. Or go shopping. Sing, that's a good one, okay. How about going fishing, watching a sports game? That does it for some. Now, I'm not knocking any one of those things. They're all good things, all right? But they are all short-term solutions. They don't really solve anything. And sometimes, some of them can have negative, long-term results. Eating your favorite dessert is the one that comes to mind. <laughs> Instead of doing those things, try starting a new habit that will help you feel better over a longer period of time. One simple habit that we've been looking at this morning is, and it has amazing long-term benefits, is the habit of practicing gratitude and thankfulness. I'm going to shift just a little bit here. We've read from Philippians over and over, the good things that Paul says about it. 
But there's an amazing amount of study that has gone into scientifically why gratitude is better and is good for you. They, they have found that gratitude can, can make you mentally happier and physically it can make you healthier. And third, spiritually, it can make you stronger in your faith. First, we're going to look at the mental one, all right? Mentally, gratitude reduces negative emotions like envy. Low, it can lower your anxiety. It can reduce depression and stress, all of those things. And gratitude enhances things like joy, serenity, hope, peacefulness, greater life satisfaction. All of this, all of those things that I just listed can lead to something called greater resilience. And you say resilience? Yeah, resilience. That means having greater capacity for dealing with difficulties in life. And I'll give you a prime example. And again, this was scientifically studied. After 9-11, in New York City, they studied people. And, they, and those who found ways to be grateful and thankful those people were better able to cope with what had happened and to come through the crisis stronger. That's an amazing thought. Just simply finding a way to be thankful helped them to come through it better. They had more resilience. They had gratitude. The second thing that mentally it can do for us is to give us better sleep. The cornerstone of good mental health is high quality sleep. And according to research, gratitude journaling, getting a journal and writing in it, your gratitude, helps people to sleep better. I, looked, I read that and I thought, well, let's just pray before we go to bed and thank the Lord for all the things he's done for us. Think of as many things as you can and thank him. Or if, you like, if you're the kind that likes filling out things. I don't. <laughs> I'm not a person who does enjoys journaling. But if you enjoy it, to get your journal out and list every night as many things as you can that you're thankful for. Science says you will sleep better if you do that. And it will help you to be happier in the long run. Third, mentally, gratitude makes you optimistic and giving. In the very first controlled experiments they did on this subject, they asked 411 people to write out a letter of thanks to somebody in their lives that really deserved it, and then to give it to them. And the people who did that were happier for a whole month. They, they were happier for a whole month just simply by writing a letter out and giving it to somebody to let them know how much they appreciate them. It's an amazing thought. All right. So try it. Do it. Why, you know, why do it for just one week? Why not do it several times in a month? And, and you'll find that, gratitude, that happiness just flowing over through your whole life. Thank people. Thank people for what they have done for you. And then... We said mentally, but also physically, gratitude is good for us. The health benefits of gratitude. We already read in the Bible, it says a cheerful heart is good medicine, but research shows it too, also. It, it's really quite simple if you think about it. If you are grateful for things, it's going to reduce the stress and promote positive emotions. And that's going to change, the scientists tell us, that's going to change our brains and our body's chemistry, actually. And that protects our vital organs, especially those that are stress-sensitive, like our hearts, our cardiovascular system. And so being grateful affects our health in a very real way. We already mentioned the the importance of, of gratitude in helping us to have a good night's sleep for our mental health. We need a good night's sleep for our physical health too. And so it helps with giving us good sleep and gives us better physical health on that score. The third thing under physical health is 
that it can help lower our pain. Oh, that's a good thing to know. <laughs> if you're hurting for whatever reason, if you've got physical pain, headache, arthritis, try thinking of things you're thankful for. It might help. It can help coronary patients recover faster. How? Again, it helps to helps them to be more willing to take care of themselves, they tell us. People who are grateful are more willing to make dietary changes or to quit smoking. So they're more willing to take care of themselves if they are grateful for things. And they also experience less stress. We've already talked about that. And so they recover from their coronary problems quicker. I thought of this. It, doesn't, it didn't say it in the study, but I know that when I had cancer, they told me to, to be positive and optimistic and happy. And I've been reading all about how gratitude does that. So gratitude ought to help with cancer too. That's my own mind. It's not science, but it makes my own mind make sense. <laughs> and finally... Oh, I, I, one other thing I wanted to mention, that God told us first that gratitude was good for us. And, being, and rejoicing and being thankful are things we ought to do. So when secular science, sometimes even tinged a bit with New Age stuff, you'll, you'll run into that if you read these articles, says, oh yeah, being grateful is good for you. Does that mean, oh, well, we don't want to pay attention to that. That's secular and New Age stuff. No, because God already told us. God already told us. We can trust what God says and just look at all this scientific proof as saying, oh, well, they're just confirming what God already told us. And we can follow God's advice. And then finally, gratitude makes us spiritually stronger. Gratitude keeps us humble. If you think about it, that's easy to see. If you're being thankful to God for things he has given us, you are showing and admitting that you are acknowledging your need of him. If we're acknowledging our need of him, then we are being humble. A group, group of researchers discovered that express, expressing gratitude can make us less egocentric. Okay, let's break that down just a second. Egocentric, those are the people who think highly of themselves, right? Could we say they are proud? That's the very center of sin. And so if we are less egocentric, we're more humble and more drawing close to God. It helps reduce pride. And along with that, in that same study, they discovered that there was an increase in the willingness to share, an increase in a willingness to, to help people out. In other words, gratitude reduces materialism. We're not talking about the basic need for survival. That's something we all need. We're talking about, rather, the constant desire to have more than what we've got. It's the need, could we say covetousness, and it's been consistently tied in studies to less happiness and satisfaction. So if we covet things, if we are not satisfied with things, we won't be as happy. That's a little bit like, duh, <laughs> but yeah. It's important as we're analyzing this to recognize it and apply it to our lives. So if we practice gratitude, then we find ourselves more satisfied and happy with what we already have. In other words, less materialistic. Just like Paul, who was content no matter his circumstances. That's what we're aiming for. And then I found an article recently that goes right along with this. It said that materialism harms our marriages. Oh, so if we are less materialistic because we're being thankful to God and showing gratitude in all of these things, then we're helping our marriages because if we're materialistic, 
we're hurting our marriage. All right? If this affects our relationships, the way that we are thankful to God affects our relationships. There's obviously many benefits of gratitude. Believe me, I left out a bunch as I put this list together. Um, But this morning, let's get practical. How do we practice gratitude? We've already mentioned praying before going to bed. And it stands to reason then, if praying before going to bed is good for us, stands to reason praying in the morning would be good for us too. And Daniel used to pray morning, noon, and night. I think we could follow his example. It's a good thing to do. Just be sure that your prayers are not, oh Lord, help me with this and fix this and do that. Make sure you're thanking God for what he has done. And list as many things as you can think of of why we are thankful to God. Some people like to keep a journal, like I mentioned, either in a notebook or digitally. There are some apps that you can get for your phone that let you enter it on your phone if you like, if you'd rather do it that way. Just watch out because most of those are new age oriented. Doesn't mean you can't use them. Just remember to keep your gratitude aimed at God. That's the thing to remember. And when you're listing things, Sometimes it's easy to say, oh, well, I, I listed that one yesterday. I, it, you know, I need to think of something new. No, you don't. We can think the same thankful thoughts over and over and remind ourselves. Every morning I sit, well, every morning during the winter, I sit in our, in our door and, and, and watch the sun coming up. And I'm thankful every time for the colors God has given us. And they start off just dark, you know, and then there's this little strip of orange, and then that orange kind of spreads, and there's this deep blue that's gorgeous. And then it turns lighter, and there's yellow, and another color of blue, a different shade of blue. And I say, thank you, Lord, for all these colors. I'm so thankful to God. So you can say the same things over and over again. And then do work on coming up with new things too. There will be new things in your life that you think of that you want to thank God for. And then the third way, or third thing to remember about how to be grateful is to remember that Paul, a couple of times in his letter, thanked his friends. Remember not only to thank God, but to thank your friends, your loved ones, for what they have done for you. Because that's an important part of being grateful and learning to, in, to have an attitude of gratitude all the time. Paul did it. We can do it too. So we've seen multiple examples in the book of Philippians. We've looked at science that backs it all up. Let's look at just a few more inspiration type ideas. In another letter, this time to the Thessalonians, Paul says, 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18. Be joyful always. Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. And I know that that verse sometimes makes people scratch their head and, ah, oh, thankful in all circumstances? Think about him in prison. I think it's exactly what he meant. He meant to be thankful at all times. Ellen White says this command is an assurance that even the things which appear to be against us will work for our good. God would not bid us be thankful for that which would do us harm. That's an amazing thought. God is telling us to be thankful for everything and we can be thankful because those things will not do us harm and he will bring good out of it. Many of the Psalms, if you read through Psalms over and over again, David is thankful for this and thankful for that and thankful to God for his mercies. That's the biggest one of all. (laughs) I love reading the Psalms over and over again. He says that. And we often find music worked into thanking God. Right, Don? It music is there. Nehemiah 12, 31. Nehemiah says, I had the leaders of Judah go up on top of the wall. I assigned two large choirs to give thanks. Don't you love it? 
two large choirs to give thanks. I think we're going to enjoy doing that in heaven, don't you? It's going to be a good time. And then Psalm 95, 1 and 2. Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song. Our scripture reading this morning was Psalm 100, all singing praises and thanks to God and rejoicing in what he has done for us. Another quote, both of these quotes I've read from Ellen White are from the chapter Mind Cure in Ministry of Healing. She says, nothing tends more to promote health of body and of soul. Wow, that's what we've been talking about. Nothing tends more to promote health of body and of soul than does a spirit of gratitude and praise. It is a positive duty to resist melancholy, discontented thoughts and feelings as much a duty as it is to pray. If we are heaven bound, as in heaven bound bluegrass band, if we are heaven bound, how can we go as a band of mourners groaning and complaining all along the way to our father's house? That's not what he wants. He wants us to be thanking and praising him all the way. Finding things, even when people are against us. Finding ways to thank God and to praise him because something good might be coming from it. There are so many verses full of these thoughts. I probably left out your favorite. It's as if, hmm, it's as if God knew that we would be needing to hear and review these thoughts often. (laughs) I have a feeling. He knew that we needed it. And he puts it in scripture for us to read and be reminded to thank him, to thank our friends and family, to have an attitude of gratitude. I challenge you, pick up habits of gratitude. Ask God to help it be your attitude all the time. Father, we come to you this morning fully recognizing our need of you of your righteousness to cover us and thanking you and praising you, Lord, that you have given that to us. And we pray, Father, that you will help us to constantly remember to thank you for all the things that we have in this earth and especially for Jesus and what he has done for us. Be with us now as we go on into the next season of remembering when you came. We thank you for that, Lord, and for the joy that that brings into our lives. For Jesus' sake, amen.